What's up, nerds and nerdettes and wee little nerdlings all? To your buddy Big John and G, the two gun picture presents Legendary Gaming! <laughs> Still hot on this! So, yeah, we got through the unboxing of Cthulhu Wars, and then we saw the setup of the game. Now, we're gonna see how this game is played. So, I'll see you down at the table. Welcome, 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 my friends, to How to Play Cthulhu Wars, a Sandy Peterson game by Peterson Games. <laughs> All right, so uh, the first part is the setup. Now, since you've seen the setup, let's, let's just jump right into this. The first thing I want to do is I want to explain to you the object of the game. The object of the game is getting to 30, to 30 Doom points. But you also have to have all six of your faction's spell books. And when that happens, the game is over. And the player with all six spell books and 30 or more, the highest of 30 or more Doom points, will win the game. Now, why don't we take a look at the map? So, before we jump into the turn-by-turn -turn, uh, and actions and everything that you can do on your turns, before we get into all that, there's a few things I wanted to point out. So, on the map, and this is still set up for a three-player game, just like if you saw the setup, and I hope you did. So, this is still set up for a three-player game. And I wanted to point out that there's free movement in this game. Like, yes, this is a landmass. And this is an ocean. And this is another landmass. But that doesn't make a difference. Because if you're here, you can just move. And just move. There's no difference between water and land. So keep that in mind. And the other thing to keep in mind is that this is taking place on the Earth. And unless you're a flat or a theorist, then you will agree with me that the Earth is round. So therefore, remember that the North Pacific over here does link up to the North Pacific over here, as does the Indian Ocean down here, the Indian Ocean over there. So by moving from one far end of the board, you will come out on the other far end. Now let's talk about units, factions, and your pool. Your pool consists of your not-in-play-yet miniatures, spell books, and in the case of the king in yellow, your desecration tokens. So in this setup right here, two of the undead are out, leaving two in the pool. Three of the cultists are out, leaving three in the pool. And one of the Bayaki is out, leaving three in the pool, along with Hastor, and the king in yellow as well in your pool. These are the spell books that are in your pool that you have not yet gotten to use yet, you have not claimed, such as these two are claimed, so they are not in your pool. These other four would be considered in your pool. Your units would be the minis that you have out in the field. So there were three, there were three cultists, that were out in the field. We have one, we have two, we have three. And I was wrong, there are six undead, so there was four out in the field. One, two, three, four. And one of the four Bayakis were out in the field. Those are your units. There are three different categories of units. The first category is cultists. In the core game, factions only have access to Acolyte, the Acolyte cultists. The next category of unit would be monsters. In the case of the Yellow King, 
The monsters are the undead. And the Bayaki. And the third category that they have access to are the Great Old Ones. And in the case of the King in Yellow, that would be Hastor, he whose name is not spoken. And the king in yellow. Keep in mind that all the factions use unique monsters. No faction will use the same monsters as another faction. Also remember that you cannot place more units on the map than you actually have in your pool. That is your limit. A unit in your pool is not in play and vice versa that can be very important to remember in gameplay and lastly about units remember that if a unit is killed or eliminated during the game it goes back in your pool now i would like to address gates and their importance in the game each player will start with one controlled gate in an area where they begin the game. The King in Yellow starts here in Europe, so they begin the game with a gate. And one of the Acolytes, the Cultists, is on top of it, as you notice. Here in the Indian Ocean, we have a gate, and we have a Cultist of Cthulhu, who is in the same area, the Indian Ocean, but is not on the gate. And in Africa, we have another gate. And we have one of the Black Goat of the Woods cultists hanging out in the sea, not even in the same area as either of the two nearest gates. There can only ever be one cultist on a gate at any given time. Monsters and Great Old Ones cannot occupy a gate. However, the Black Goat of the Woods does have Dark Young Ones and they can, they can bend the rules and occupy gates. A gate with a cultist on it is considered controlled while a gate without a cultist on it is considered abandoned. There can only ever be one gate in an area at a time. Now keep in mind that these gates become very, very valuable because of the doom and the power that you can accumulate by controlling one. During the course of the game, you're going to realize that there are special abilities between factions, also between Elder Gods, the Old Ones, and also with the spell books that you're going to be able to acquire and that you will need to acquire during the course of the game. Spell books, there are the six slots on the right hand side of your faction card. And each faction has different requirements that you're going to need to fulfill in order to acquire the spell books. And when you do make one of these acquirements, such as, as your action, select another player who gains three doom. You can then take any of the spells, doesn't matter which one, and fill that slot with it. This one up here, successfully desecrate an area marked with this glyph. So if on an area of the map, you performed a desecration and left that marker there, you would be able to take any one of these and put it here. Now, once it's here, it stays there. You can only do these actions once to acquire a spell book. Each of the spell books are going to give you a unique ability. 
such as Passion, which is an ongoing ability. When one or more of your cultists are eliminated by an enemy, killed, captured, etc., gain one power. Some of them may also be actions, such as Shriek of the Bayaki. Move any or all Bayaki from their current area or areas to any one area on the map. Some of them may only be done as an action, such as Zingaya. If undead or in an area with enemy acolyte cultists, your enemy must eliminate an acolyte cultist, then place an undead in the area. You will also find that each faction also has their own unique ability. The King in Yellows is called Feast, and it can be done during the Gather Power phase. We will be getting to the phases in a moment. So Feast gain a plus one power for each area containing both a Desecration token and one or more of your units. Your Great Old Ones also have abilities that are special and can bend the rules and do extra fun stuff for you and to your enemies. In this case, the King in Yellow has Desecrate that's used as an action. If the king is in an area with no desecration tokens, roll one die. If the roll is equal to or less than your units in that area, including the king, place a desecration token in the area. Whether you succeed or fail, place a monster or cultist with a cost of two or less in the area. Hastor's ability is Vengeance. If Hastor is involved in a battle, choose which combat results or apply to which enemy. Example. Apply a kill to a particular Great Old One. Depending on the faction, depending on the Great Old One. Some of these special abilities, as you've already seen, will take place during the action phase, the battle phase, the gather power phase. But there are still others that will take place during the doom phase. And, as you also saw here, there are some that are even ongoing. The last thing I would like to mention before we jump into turn by turn, phase by phase of this game, is I want to talk about <laughs> the Elder Sign Tokens. These are trophies, actually. They range from one to two to three points. And there'll be occasions during the game where you will have to Go into the bag and blindly choose one, which you're not going to show the other players. And this becomes a point or two or more that isn't going to score until the end of the game. Sort of secret points, so to speak. Now, any time during the game, if you choose to or are forced to reveal one of your Elder Tokens, it does not go back in the bag. It will automatically be scored at that point, and then it will be discarded from the game. Not going back in the bag. And if you ever run out of these Elder Sign Trophy Tokens, then the player that was supposed to get one will instead just get one point granted to them. This obviously will not be a secret to the other players. The phases of play of the game are the action phase, the gather power phase, determine first player phase, and the doom phase. The action phase is, is, the, is the meat of a lot of what's going on during the game. It's during the action phase that you're going to be able to move your units around, you can use your spell books to cast spells, you can engage the other players in battle. This is where you're interacting, where the great old ones are destroying the world during their war of dominance with each other. <laughs> yeah, it gets pretty hot and heavy during the action phase. So the first player, now at the beginning of the game, if somebody is playing the Great Cthulhu, they will always start the game as the first player. Keep that in mind. The first player will be taking an action. 
And then the second player after that will take an action, and this will go around until all the players have taken their first action. Then, the first player takes a second action, following around again. During your turn, you must take an action. You cannot pass on this. Every action you take will cost power, and when you use the power to perform an action, you will simply mark it by lowering on your power bar the appropriate number of power points that you have used. If you literally have no power left, then you cannot take an action and your turn will be skipped. Lastly, you do have the option of not taking an action. But if you do not take an action, if you choose that, then any power you have will automatically be reduced to zero. The action phase of the game will continue going around from player to player until everyone has zero power left. That will end the action phase. Some of the actions that you can take are to recruit a cultist, to summon a monster, to awaken a great old one, create a gate, units to move, battling, and capturing an enemy cultist. Recruiting a cultist will cost you a mere one power. Faction monsters are different. In the case of the King in Yellow, the Yellow Sign faction, Undead will also cost one point. Bayaki will cost two points. You can awaken a Great Old One, and each has a different cost. Four for the King in Yellow, ten for Hastor. If you are in an area that has no gate, you can spend three power points and you can place a gate in that area. If you wish to move a unit from an area to another area, it will cost you one power to move one space with one unit. It costs you no movement to have one of your cultists occupy a gate. You can spend a power point in order to enter battle. If you are in an area with another faction, then you can choose to send your forces against theirs. In order to conduct battle, each side will roll dice equal to the combat total that they find on their cards. In this case, the Yellow Sign faction has zero combat for the cultist. The undead roll one dice less than the total undead in the battle. So four undead would roll three dice. There are two undead here, so they would be rolling two dice. The Bayaki roll one die more than the total of Bayaki. There are two, so that would add another three dice to the pool. Shubnugarath of the Black Goat faction. His combat is equal to the total number of cultists that are in play, plus controlled gates. If he has the red sign spell, that's plus one dark young in play as well. So in this case... Let's say that there are enough to give Shubnagrath a total of six dice. Both sides will roll their dice. Any roll of a one, two, or three is a miss and doesn't count. In this example, it would leave Shubnugarov with a 5 and a 6, while the yellow sign would have a 5 and a 4. Rolls of a 6, such as the Black Goat faction got, are kills. 
and they will remove a faction from the game. Fours and five are what are called pain results. The player who initiated combat will resolve their pain scores first. In this case, the king in yellow. When an enemy faction unit is pained, they will retreat, and they will retreat to the nearest adjoining area that does not contain a faction member of the faction that just pained them. In this case, Shubnigarath would go to Europe. And one of the undead would go to Africa. And finally, as an action, you may opt to capture an enemy cultist. A captured cultist is considered eliminated. However, the captured cultist does not go back to the faction's pool. It will instead go to the faction's pool who captured it. At a later time, they can sacrifice the capture in order to get power. In order to capture an enemy cultist, you must have a monster or great old one in the same area as the cultist you wish to capture, and the cultist must have no protectors there. Cultists are lowest on the rung, and they are protected by monsters, and monsters and cultists are both protected by great old ones. Re be sure to remember that pecking order. It's important. You may only capture one enemy cultist per capture cultist action taken. Your monsters in Great Old One will never protect another faction's cultists from capture by a third party. Only a cultist's own faction's monsters and Great Old Ones can actually protect them. Taking control of or abandoning a gate costs zero zero power. It is an unlimited action. After each of the players has brought their power down to zero and the action phase is over, you will move to the gather power phase. Now, during the gather power phase, you're going to do exactly that. You're going to be replenishing your power. Every player will earn one power point per cultist in play. They will also earn two power points per controlled gate. One power per abandoned gate. Now this is a point that every player will get. If there are three abandoned gates on the board, then all players will gain three power for that. Any captured enemy cultists that you have will be returned to their owner's player's pool, and you will gain one point for each enemy cultist you return. This is them being sacrificed so that you can give power to your faction. There is also the minimum power rule. At the end of the gather power phase, check your power score. If your power score is less than half the power score of the player with the most, you will raise it to that halfway point. If one of the players in the group has a power score of 18 and you have a 7, you will get to raise your power score to 9. Then it's time to move on to Determine First Player Phase. The player that has the most power will become the first player for the next round. And it's the first player that gets to decide which order, which way the turn order will be going. <laughs> If two or more players are tied for highest power, then the player who last had the first player token 
gets to decide who gets it this time. There are two parts to the Doom phase. The Doom Shock advancement, which happens simultaneously for all players, and the Rituals of Annihilation, which occurs in player order. Each player will get to advance the Doom track one space for each gate that they control. Then, starting with the first player, each player, in order, will decide whether they choose to perform a Ritual of Annihilation or not. Each player gets the chance to do one, and only one, Ritual of Annihilation. So in order to do the Ritual of Annihilation, you will have to spend power equal to the score of the ritual track. At this point, it is at 5, so I would knock this from 15 down to 10. We then get a chance to raise this up to the next level, making it that much more expensive the next time a player wishes to try to raise it. You will then advance your Doom marker on the Doom track one space per gate that you control, doubling your Doom increase based on the gates this Doom phase. So yes, it's already... It's already advancing your winning chances. And finally, you are going to get a chance to gain one Elder Sign trophy token that you will not show to the other players. If during this time, the Ritual Tracker had actually moved from the final space to the instant death. <laughs> well, then that means that at the end of this doom phase, the game, the game will end and victory will then be determined. When a faction reaches 30 or more doom along the doom track, the game will end. Since Doom increases most often during the Doom phase, it normally ends during the Doom phase, and if so, complete the entire Doom phase before declaring final victory. As previously mentioned, the game can also end during the Doom phase when a Ritual of Annihilation marker reaches the instant death space. All players who have not had a chance to perform a Ritual of Annihilation may still do so. At the very end of the Doom phase, the game will end, even if no one has reached 30 or more Doom points yet. When the game's end is triggered, and after adding everyone's Elder Signs to their Doom totals, the player with the most Doom and with six spell books on their faction card is the winner. If the player with the most Doom does not have six spell books, whoever has the most Doom, along with the six spell books of their faction, will become the winner. If two or more players have the most Doom, and both have all six spellbooks, the game ends in a drawer. Both players rejoice in their shared victory, or continue to attempt to devour each other. <laughs> if the game ends and no player has all six spellbooks, then humanity wins. All great old ones, monsters, and evil cultists are sucked back through the collapsing gates. Yay! But all players do lose the game together. And there we go, my friends. In under 30 minutes, Cthulhu Wars, how to play this game. So that's it in a nutshell. Yes, 30 minutes and that is the nutshell. Uh, in the rulebook, they have great tips per faction, tips on how to both play a faction, as well as tips when you are facing certain factions. And those will become helpful in the game, especially for first-time players. You're definitely going to want to check those pages out. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for going over to Facebook, to Instagram, and to Twitter. Thank you so much for going there and seeing what Two Gun Pixie has going on over in those arenas. I also want to give a great big shout-out to all of you, all of you that have been heading over to the official Two Gun Pixie Zazzle store. Thank you so much for checking out all the nerdy merch that we have over there. And of course, as always, thank you all 
for coming right here, right here to YouTube and supporting us. Thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thank you for liking our videos, for commenting on our videos, and thank you so much for continuing to share our videos. I'm your buddy Big Johnny G, the Two Gun Pixel Presents Legendary Gaming, and my friends, I am out of here. <laughs>